And welcome back to the Daily Dribble Podcast, guys. As always, I'm your host, Nick Zamet. Absolutely thrilled to be back for another action-packed episode, to say the least. I've said it week in and week out since the season concluded, but despite the on-court action being over, the off-court action is only continuing to heat up, and this week has been no exception. Big episode, got a couple of quick odds and ends to run through in terms of some of the notable moves that went down throughout the week. Then before getting into a bit of a, uh, I can't really coin a name for it, but it's kind of teams on the way up, teams on the way down. Now, I'll get into what that means very, very shortly. Before I do so, though, just want to give a big shout out to both Stadium Scene and The Cover. Thrilled to continue to be a part of those two networks, continuing to showcase my work here at The Daily Dribble, as well as a whole host of other content creators in and around Australia, New Zealand, the US and Canada. Very, very appreciative of all their continued hard work there. Just want to make note, being very quiet on the socials this week. Uh, if you tuned into last week's show, I mentioned how I was having a little bit of trouble on the phone front. I carried across to this week and essentially my phone went kaput. Uh, so if you you have noticed that the uh, the socials have been quiet there, you've been following them on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and TikTok. Very appreciative. The content will continue to ramp back up now that I've uh, I've got a new phone. It's incredible. It's kind of like when the power goes out or the water gets cut off. Same with your phone. You don't realize how much you use it and need it until you don't have it. I've certainly found that out the hard way this week. You know, I try not to be someone who's addicted to my phone. Um, but that being said, you really notice it a lot when you don't have, have it. Uh, so, yeah, very thankful to be back in the realm of social media and uh, we'll push on once again with the content. Okay, let's get into some very quick odds and ends, just highlighting a few few points here. The first of which was the trade that went down during the week, a three-team trade resulting in the Sacramento Kings landing DeMar DeRozan on a three-year $74 million deal. In this deal, the, the San Antonio Spurs received Harrison Barnes and the Chicago Bulls received Chris Duarte and two second-round picks. Now, by adding DeRozan to the Kings, they are just all offense. They have fully embraced what they were a couple of seasons ago, and that was a team that was going to put up 140 points on any given night. I think they certainly get better by making this move. I am somewhat worried about having Sabonis, DeRozan, and De'Aaron Fox on the court at the same time, who aren't great three-point shooters. Now, Fox is a little bit hit and miss. He knocks them down when needed. He's not overly consistent in that regard, so that is a bit of a worry. But for me, what's really going to be fascinating, as I mentioned a moment ago, is how many games that they can actually put up. Let's let's say 130 points per game. I'm going to say, I'm going to go with 28. I reckon about a third of the season, they're going to go 130 points or over. How many do you reckon? It is an absurd total when you think about it. If you look back on the NBA 10, 20, 30 years ago, a team putting up 130 points on any given night was pretty exceptional. For the Kings to be doing this, you know, which I think is certainly plausible, one in every three games is just ridiculous. I personally think this is going to be their best route to success. You cannot now, with the team that you've built, like defense isn't in their identity at all. You've got to double down, which they have, go all out attack. Uh, I'm super excited to see how they play. They're going to be one of the most must watch teams within the league, full stop. Um, they were already, but adding DeRozan just enhances that. For the Bulls, getting something for DeRozan there, Chris Duarte and two first, two second round picks, should I say, is is serviceable. Um, as I said, DeRozan was leaving anyway, so getting anything in return there is a bit of a bonus. The Spurs, they pick up Harrison Barnes, put him alongside Victor Wembenyama and Chris Paul there. Tell you what, it's it's not. I wouldn't say they're a team that's going to make too many waves, but they're a team that could certainly push towards play playing contention. I wouldn't say playoffs, but playing contention. They're certainly going to make a lot of other teams in the league. They're going to give them headaches on any given night, uh, which will be nice to see. I think, you know, as I said, that three of Barnes, Wemby, Chris Paul, Keldon Johnson, uh, Jeremy Sohan. There, there's enough to like about the Spurs' like future going forward. Uh, but at the moment, I still see them, you know, sitting lowly in the West. 
In other news, Caleb Martin has joined the Philadelphia 76ers on a four-year, $32 million deal. He averaged 10 points, four rebounds, and two assists last season for the Miami Heat. Knocked down some very, very big threes as well. I think it's a really handy acquisition. And I mentioned, was it last week or the week prior? They all kind of blend into one now that after the signing of Paul George, they had a little bit of work to do filling out the rest of their roster. I think they've done an exceptional job thus far. Adding Martin is a huge get as well. A really handy role player. As I said, does a bit of everything. And now if he can keep that three-point shooting up to par, I really like where Philly's headed at the moment. Uh, looking really good. Ubre there as well. With that big throw of Maxi, Embiid and Paul George. They're a team that's going to be dominant in the East. Um, that being said, if you're a long, long, long time listener of the show, you know that over the course of a couple of years, Philly are a team that I've put quite a lot of stock into. And they've continually, year in and year out, just, you know, absolutely smashed all of my kind of predictions um, going below. So I don't want to hype them up too early yet. Time will tell, though, but a very nice pick up there in Caleb Martin. And likewise, Daniel Tice has agreed on a one-year deal with the New Orleans Pelicans. Once Jonas Valanciunas moved on there, they certainly needed to replenish their big man stocks. Getting Tice there is not too much of a needle mover, but certainly a serviceable piece in his own right. Finally, from odds and ends, just wanted to uh, show a little bit of a love to a guy that I've, I don't want to say banged on about, but I've probably... I don't quite know how to put it. He hasn't, won a bit, he hasn't been one of my favourite players, Tobias Harris. And that's purely just based on the level of contract that he's received in the past. To what he's delivered on court, it hasn't really married up too well. That being said, I really want to shine a light on him this week and his brother there, former G League forward, Terry Harris. They're teaming up to bring much-needed affordable housing to LA this, they're at the minute bringing 270 housing units in three locations to Echo Park um, in LA there. The goal is to have a thousand units in development by the end of the year across the neighborhood. All these properties are expected to be built from scratch and not refurbished old buildings. And it's just a great example of what you know, NBA players, athletes, celebrities of a whole, as a whole can do. Like They can do a lot of good with the money they possess. Now, as I said, I've banged on about Tobias Harris being overpaid. He can be overpaid as much as he wants. If he's going to do things like this, it really is just a great kind of precedent he's setting for other players to continue to build communities and, you know, do good. Um, it's uh, very well done there to Terry and Tobias Harris. Again, just wanted to shine a bit of a light on things that, you know, often it's only on-court action that kind of captures the headlines, likewise trades off-court. But things like this need to be highlighted because it really is impactful um, what NBA players can do when they put their mind to it. So very well done there to Tobias Harris. Everyone hold me accountable. If I say a bad word about him, uh, you know, let me know. There will be no more poor words said about Tobias Harris. Guys, let's push on. The Daily Dribble. Okay, as I said at the start of the show, this is going to be a, a little segment called Teams on the Up, Teams on the Down. Now, these are essentially teams that, you know, based on the last couple of weeks, what's gone on throughout the off-season, that could be on the rise in the standings or on the way down next season. So I've got three on the way up, three on the way down. Would love to hear from you guys what I got right, what I got wrong. Continue to hit me up on the socials, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and TikTok. Um, I'm very much looking forward to re-engaging in all those conversations with you guys. It's kind of been a nice little social media detox over the last couple of days, but um, certainly looking forward to uh, touching base with you all again very, very soon. On the way up, let's start firstly with the Dallas Mavericks. Now, they made huge strides last season, made it to the NBA Finals, fell short there against the eventual winners, the Boston Celtics. But what they've done over the last couple of weeks, adding Clay makes them so much more potent. They aren't as reliant on Kyrie and Luca to get a bucket. Derek Lively's going to have another year of experience under his belt, which is just massive. The strides he made as a rookie was second to none. A full season of PJ Washington and Daniel Gafford is massive as well. Really, that was kind of the turning point for their season on both ends of the floor once they got those two. 
They finished fifth last season. Now, I'm predicting with the squad they've got, with the strides they've made, I'm predicting a top three finish for the Dallas Mavericks. That being said, all of these are subject to change as the off-season progresses. Um, I'm certainly looking forward to a little bit closer to the start of next season doing my kind of predictions for both the East and Western Conference, where I'll be a little bit more concrete in these um, in these standings. But I, I certainly think the Dallas Mavericks are on the way up. They're a hugely exciting team, and they're certainly going to get better next season by adding Clay. So advantageous having a player that doesn't need the ball a lot at all, but can still make a huge impact. I think he's going to fit in seamlessly well with the Dallas Mavericks. Secondly, I've got the New York Knicks. Now, the Knicks finished second last season at 50 and 32. I've been a little bit cheeky with this one, and it's kind of a a bit of a common trend, as you'll notice as we go across more teams, um, that I'm still predicting that they'll finish in and around that second to third mark, but I think they're going to be considerably close to 60, 60 wins. Anyone who's played sport, you know, I currently play. Anyone who's played sport, many of you guys do, the listeners out there, know that chemistry is huge. It really doesn't matter what team sport you play. Chemistry is a huge, huge component of success. Bringing in Mikhail Bridges and essentially running back this Villanova championship winning squad there in New York, in New York is chemistry to the max. Now, I've spoken quite a little bit about the Villanova Knicks over the last couple of weeks. I'm sure many of you have seen over social media. This is a real thing. Mikhail Bridges, Dante DiVincenzo, Jalen Brunson, and Josh Hart, the chemistry that they're going to be able to, you know, build upon in New York is super, super exciting. They're going to be must-watch TV. Madison Square Garden is going to be rocking. Bringing, hopefully, a healthy Julius Randle and OG Ananobi back into the fold is going to be a very tough team to stop. The only worry is losing Isaiah Hartenstein to the OKC Thunder there the other week. I think they'll be able to recover pretty well from this. Mitchell Robinson back into that starting role. I like their depth a lot more. Just think they're a really well-rounded team now. And, you know, Jalen Brunson is certainly the, the star, the superstar within that squad. But they've just got a lot of star players, a lot of really high-caliber guys who are going to get it done on both ends of the floor. So... Despite, I, th- I think the Celtics are still going to be the top number one seed in the East. But I think the, not- the Knicks will certainly be pushing uh, a lot harder than uh, the Celtics had it this season. So, yeah, 50 and 32 for the 2023 2024 campaign. I reckon they'll get a lot closer to 60 wins there, which would be a huge achievement. And who knows how far they could go in the playoffs. Finally, the Memphis Grizzlies. They finished 13th this season. I have no doubt in my mind that they will go considerably higher than this next season. The key, though, is going to be staying healthy. Now, even even just a little bit healthier will help. They were plagued from start to finish. Uh, One of the most decimated rosters I've seen in recent times. It was really, they were rolling out G League teams. And it, it was a tough watch. You know, even the most NBA hardcore fan or analyst, some of the squads they were rolling out, like me personally, I had no idea on half of their players. Um, but hopefully they can stay healthy. Having Jar Morant back, Desmond Bain back, gives you a great foundation to work with there. For me, Zach Eady is the big swing piece. Seven foot four, comes out of college with mixed reviews. If he can come in and transition his game to the NBA level, then look out. He could be a hell of a force linking up with Bain, Jaron Jackson Jr., Marcus Smart, Derek Rose as well within those ranks. I think for them, getting back to the playoffs is certainly the goal. I personally think they'll be closer to a playing team. And that just purely speaks to how good I think the West is. I'll I'll give them around that ninth mark, uh, but they'll certainly improve on what they did the season gone by. Very exciting. Hopefully the Grizz to be a force once again. There's three up. Let's go three down. Firstly, I've got the Phoenix Suns. They finished sixth last season, yet I see them falling. I think teams like the Pelicans, the Kings, the Warriors, they've all gotten better around them, whereas they've essentially stagnated this offseason. They think they've got the squad to that's a championship-ready squad. And on paper, Bradley Beal, Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, Grayson Allen, 
Yusuf Nurkic, as a starting five, it should be a championship caliber team. I don't see them at that level, though. I don't think Bill's looked quite like a superstar since that move from Washington. Granted, he doesn't really need to be now playing alongside Durant and Booker. I think there's a bit of an issue, a fit issue there with ball handling. Now, I mentioned a few moments ago, Dallas bringing in Clay Thompson. A guy that doesn't need the ball, but can still be hugely impactful. All these guys that, you know, those, those three stars. So let's compare the three stars from Dallas. You've got Luca, Kyrie, and Clay. All are going to have very clear, defined roles about what's expected of them. You transition to Phoenix, you've got Bill, Booker, and Durant. All these guys want their touches. All these guys want their points. All these guys want their looks. I think that's just a real fit issue with ball handling and identity, a bit of an identity crisis, essentially. I'm predicting at this stage they'll be a playing team, probably around that eight eighth seed at, at this stage as i said time will tell a little bit closer to the season where i do my official kind of standings predictions but for as good as they are on paper i don't think i just spoke about the knicks and how important chemistry is i think these guys lack it i think there's a real identity crisis there in phoenix and i think that's going to contribute to them falling down the standings moving ahead to the miami heat <clears throat> Pardon me. The Heat finished eighth last season at 46 and 36. Again, another team that I don't think positionally is going to move too far. But win loss record wise, I think they're going to slip quite a bit more. I, I predict them being under a 500 team. With a core of Tyler Hero, Jimmy Butler, Bam Adebayo, and Terry Rozier, are they going to be able to beat these heavy hitters in the East? I don't think so. And again, it's somewhat like a case like the Phoenix Suns. It's not that they've gotten worse. It's just all these other teams have gotten better. I'm going to say, again, around that 8th to ninth mark, I, as they finish this season, um, I don't think they'll bottom out too much further than that. But I can't see them going much higher either. Finally, the Atlanta Hawks. Bit of a rinse and repeat of this one of Miami. Again, I don't think they'll fall too much further just because the bottom of the East is horrendous. You know, you look at Brooklyn, Charlotte, Toronto, Detroit, some of these teams that are going to be languishing down the bottom, it's, um, it's pretty bleak. The Hawks aren't quite on that level at the moment, but they're getting further and further away from being a threat. Moving on from DeJounte Murray, heading to the Pelicans there was the big move this offseason. Trey is now unequivocally the number one ball handler. He's going to put up some ridiculous stats this season, I reckon. Like I, I reckon he's going to he's going to be averaging probably, I don't know, thirty one and eleven or thirty one and twelve probably. Uh, I, I reckon he's going to put up some ridiculous numbers this season. Outside of that, though, there's little excitement. Those acquisitions of Larry Nance and Dyson Daniels involved in that Dejounte Murray trade are solid. But in terms of moving the needle, they don't do a lot. They're not, like they're a team I've spoken a little bit about. Again, if you're a long-time listener, you'll know that we've spoken about teams that are too good to bottom out, but not good enough to contend. That's, that's where the Hawks are at at the moment. Uh, they're not in that bottom tier of Eastern teams, which I mentioned a moment ago, but they're not going to be any more than a playing team or at best first-round fodder in the playoffs. Like if they were to hypothetically finish in that 7th, 8th seed and match up against a Boston or a New York or a Philly, they're getting waxed. To make no bones about it, that is going to be a sweep. Um, I'd love to be proved wrong, but I think at the moment, the Hawks are in a real kind of funny little phase at the moment. Clint Capella still on their books. Bojan, uh, Bogdan Bogdanovic as well. But there's not enough there to help Trey and... Yeah, playing is probably their best best hope at the moment. Guys, there you have it. There are my movers moving on up and moving on down teams just based on what's happened over the course of the last few weeks. Would love to hear from you what you thought, what I got right, what I got wrong, what I got wrong. Uh, what I got wrong was that sentence there. Uh, but would love to hear what you guys think about that. Who would you have? Who do you think's on the way up? You could certainly make a case for the Warriors. I really wanted to try hard to put my Lakers in, but uh, they've not made a lot of moves. They've certainly, I don't think, on the way up. Probably a middling team as well. 
But uh, we'd love to hear from you guys what you thought. Next week. Now, as I said, off, off court, still action-packed to say the least. The news will be coming thick and fast. So keep up to date with all of the socials, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and TikTok for all the latest news from the NBA and the NBL. That being said, next week, I won't focus too much on the news that occurs throughout the week. I'm going to be starting a two-part series reviewing and grading all 30 teams from around the league based on the season just gone by. Something I've done year in and year out. Just a great opportunity to kind of reflect and, yeah, go through a grading system for all these teams. A lot of teams will fare quite well. Uh, a lot of teams probably need that, uh, what do you say? Like you don't. Do, they, do you say fail now? Or do they say, like, working towards improvement? I'm not quite sure how school works anymore. I feel like just getting a fail is, in this day and age, too cruel. I personally don't think it is, but a lot of these teams will be getting the fail mark nevertheless. Till then though guys, have a fantastic week. Enjoy everything from Summer League as that continues to take place, as well as the Olympics as they rapidly approach. Till next week though guys, take care and I'll speak to you very soon.